In this video, I'm going to be talking about section 4.4 on optimization problems. So what is an optimization problem? So in general, an optimization problem is a word problem where the overall goal of the problem is to find the maximum or minimum possible value of a quantity. So in other words, we're optimizing by finding the best value for whatever the situation is. And sometimes best means maximum. For example, we might want to maximize our profits, um, but it also might be finding a minimum. We might want to minimize our cost of something. So depending on the situation, we're either trying to find a maximum or a minimum possible value. And as with all word problems, really a big part of the, the, the work, the, the difficulty of the problem, is simply interpreting the problem and understanding what it is that you have to do. So we know in the abstract how to find maximum and minimum values using our calculus techniques. So the issue is really going to be to get from the words of the word problem to the point where we can use our knowledge of calculus. So here's an example. Of all possible pairs of positive numbers whose sum is 20, which pair has the greatest product? So if we're just sort of thinking about this question, we could imagine making a list of pairs of numbers, maybe I'll call them x and y, whose sum is 20. And there's lots of different ways to have numbers whose sum is 20. So I could have 3 and 17, for example. And we might want to check, is it really true that x plus y equals 20? If we weren't sure, we would check 3 plus 17. Yep, that really does equal 20. So this is a pair of positive numbers whose sum is 20. So that's one of the things I want to think about. And then I might look at what's x times y, right? Because I want to look at which has the greatest product. And in this case, x times y, that would be 3 times 17. That would be 51. But of course, that's not the only possible pair of positive numbers whose sum is 20. Maybe I have 16 and 4. And again, I would check to myself, okay, is that really a pair of numbers I want to think about? Yep. And then what's 16 times 4? That works out to be 64. So I say, oh, well, that's greater. That's even better. And so I might experiment in this way. I might think to myself, okay, what about uh, 9.5 and 10.5? Right? They don't have to be whole numbers. doesn't say that. So 9.5 plus 10.5, does that really equal 20? Yes. And then on my calculator, I might go ahead and type in what's 9.5 times 10.5. And when I do that, I get 99.75. And I might continue in this way, sort of experimenting, trying to figure out whether I can find the uh, a bigger product. But even if I stumble on what you might already intuit is going to be the correct answer, which is 10 and 10, which has a product of 100. How do I know, right? How do we know that this is the greatest product? It sort of seems intuitive. But how do we actually know that that is the greatest? So what we're going to do is actually apply our calculus techniques. So what we have here is we have an objective. Our objective is the thing that we want to maximize or minimize. So I'm just going to call it, you know, uh, P for product. And the objective is that we want to maximize that product. But we're not just doing this for any possible pairs of numbers, right? And if you notice in the table that I wrote on the previous slide, I wasn't writing down, you know, 30 and 40, right? I didn't think about those as my two numbers because those two numbers didn't add up to 20. So I have a limitation. I have what we call a constraint on which kinds of numbers I can use. So my constraint is that x plus y, my two numbers here, have to equal 20. I can't just think about any numbers x and y. It has to be x plus y equaling 20. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this constraint. I'm going to solve the constraint for one variable, for one of the two variables. And there's no, uh, th there's no rule that says which variable I have to solve it for. Typically, we're going to just try to solve it for whichever variable is easier to solve it for. Um, and in this case, they're both kind of equally easy. So I'm just going to solve for y since kind of, you know, my normal mode is, is solving for y is something that I typically do. But I could just as easily solve this for x. There's no reason why I'd choose one or the other. So I'm going to solve this for y. And now what I'm going to do is take that solution for y and plug it into my objective. Because now what I have is I have p equals x times 20 minus x. And now this is a calculus type of function. If I want to maximize x times 20 minus x, that's something we know how to do. We know how to take derivatives and find critical points and do all that stuff to find maximum values. We couldn't really do that stuff here because in x times y, this has too many variables. It's got two variables, and we don't know how to use our calculus techniques to maximize the value of a function with two variables. 
stay tuned for Calc 3 if you're one of the folks who's going to be taking Calc 3 eventually. We will be thinking about those sorts of problems in Calc 3. But for now, we don't have anything for that. Everything that we've done for finding maxes and mins relies on the fact that we only have one variable. But because we have this constraint, the constraint allowed us to replace one of the variables in our objective so that we only had one variable. So now I'm off to the races. Now I'm going to use all my calculus knowledge that we've learned. I'm going to multiply this out. I'm going to take a derivative, 20 minus 2x. And because I'm trying to maximize, I'm looking for critical points. So I'm going to set this equal to 0, add 2x to both sides, divide both sides by 2, I get x equals 10. Now, x equals 10 here, all I know is that this is a critical point. All I know is that this is a place where the derivative is equal to 0. Now that's probably going to be the thing that I'm looking for, but I want to test that. Remember, we spent some time talking about different ways that we could test the critical points that we find to see if we get maxes or mins. So you should do that. So I'm going to test this. I'm going to use the first derivative test. Remember, that means I'm going to draw a number line, take my critical point. I'm thinking about what's happening to p prime here. I'm going to pick a number less than 10, and I'm going to pick a number bigger than 10, and plug that into my derivative. I know that my derivative is 0 at x, at x equals 10, and so what I want to know is, is my derivative changing from positive to negative? Is it changing from negative to positive? Or, and so on. So pick a number less than 10. How about 9? So p prime of 9, what's that? That's going to be 20 minus 2 times 9, and that's going to be 2. Positive 2, which means my derivative is positive to the left of 10. Pick a number bigger than 10, how about 12? So p prime of 12, that's going to be 20 minus 2 times 12. That works out to be negative 4, that's negative. So what's happening now? My p prime is changing from positive to negative, which means my p, my original function, is changing from increasing to decreasing. It was going up, now it's going down. That means that I have a max here at x equals 10 which is what I was looking for, right? I'm trying to find the greatest product. I was trying to maximize this. So I got what I expected, but the testing gives me confidence that my answer is correct. So now the last step here would be to actually answer the question. The question says, which pair of numbers? So what are the pairs of numbers? All I know is that x equals 10. So I would say the pair of numbers, the pair of numbers that you're looking for is, well, I know x equals 10, and then what's y? Well, y, my formula for y is right here, y equals 20 minus x. So y would equal 20 minus 10, which was also 10. So we got that intuitive answer, but here we've found a way to sort of justify it and make sure that we know that it's right. Plus, this process that I'm walking you through is going to give us this uh, a way to solve these problems, even when we don't have an intuition for what the answer should be. So let's do a more complicated example where we might not have an intuition for what we think the answer should actually be here. So we've got 400 feet of fencing. We want to create a rectangular corral against the side of a barn. No fence is needed alongside the barn, and two interior fences divide the corral into three sections. So all of these blue pieces here, those are all fence. And so what we want to do is try to figure out, okay, we've got 400 feet of fence. How should we lay this corral out so that we maximize the area? And again, we can kind of experiment with this. So for example, I might say, well, what if these are 60 feet? So maybe this is 60 feet, this is 60 feet, this is 60 feet, and that's 60 feet. So if I do that, I've used up 60 plus 60 plus 60 plus 60. That's 240. So I've used up 240 feet of my fencing. I've got 400 feet left. So well, I've got 400 feet total, which means I've got 160 feet left, which means my Y would be 160. And then if I do that, my area in this case would be length times width, 60 times 160. And that's going to work out to be 9,600 square feet. Now, is that the actual maximum possible area that I could get? Well, I don't know. I mean, I could try different values, but again, I'd just be kind of making that table like we were doing in the first example and never really knowing if I was actually getting the exact answer. So instead, what we want to do is use calculus. So here's a step-by-step -step breakdown for how we're going to approach this kind of problem. First up, we're going to read the problem carefully, identify the variables, and organize the information with the picture. In this problem, they've done that for you, right? So I gave you a picture. I've labeled things x and y. So, And that will very often be something that you're given. Sometimes you're given a picture to help you out. But if not, 
whatever it is they're describing, try to draw a picture of it, try to label some things with variables so that you have a little bit more concrete sense of what's going on. Step two, identify the objective function. What is it that we're trying to maximize or minimize? If we go back and read this problem, they're asking us to maximize the area of this corral. So the objective is to maximize the area, which in this case is length times width, or in there using their variables, x and y. And then we want to identify the constraints. What is it that's limiting the variables here? What's the limitation on not being able to just say, oh, you want to maximize the area? We'll make it be 5 million feet by 7 billion feet, right? Well, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Because I have a limitation on how much fence I have. In this case, the amount of fence is 400 feet. Now, how does the amount of fence relate to the variables? Well, I've got one big long piece that's y feet long. That's this sort of bottom of my corral. And then I've got four pieces that are x feet long. So my total amount of fence, that's going to be four x's plus one y equaling 400. So I've got an objective and I've got a constraint. And sometimes you'll have multiple constraints. You'll see that in more complicated problems, you might have multiple constraints, multiple things that are limiting the values of your variables. In this case, we just have the one. Okay, so now we want to use the constraint or the constraints to eliminate all but one variable of the objective function. So remember, our objective was area equals x times y. Our constraint was 4x plus y equals 400. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the constraint. We're going to solve the constraint for one of the variables. And it typically doesn't matter which variable you solve it for. So my general advice in these kinds of situations is to choose the variable that is easier to solve for and solve for that one. So in this case, if I tried to solve for x, try to visualize that. If I try to solve for x, I'm going to have to subtract y from both sides and then divide by 4, which is going to give me some yucky looking fractions. Hmm, I don't like fractions. But instead, if I solve for y, all I have to do is subtract 4x from both sides. I don't get any yucky fractions. So it's not wrong to do it the yucky fraction way, but it gives you yucky fractions, and I don't want yucky fractions, so I'm going to avoid that. And then once I've done that, I'm going to plug that into my objective function. So my new and improved objective function. Why is it improved? It's improved because it now only has one variable in it. And now I can do step five, which is to use my calculus techniques to actually find the max and the min. Okay, so my new and improved objective function, if I multiply that out, it's going to be 400x minus 4x squared. That's the kind of thing we know how to maximize, so I'm going to take a derivative. a prime is going to be 400 minus 8x. So in this case, I'm going to set that equal to 0 to find my critical value, add 8x to both sides, divide both sides by 8, I get x equals 50. Okay, so now I'm not done though. There's two important things that I have to do after I find this critical point. One is to test it to make sure that it actually is the maximum or the minimum that I'm looking for. So I'm going to test this. Previously, I used the first derivative test. This time, I'm going to use the second derivative test. What is the second derivative test? Well, I find the formula for a double prime. Derivative of 400 is 0. Derivative of 8x is uh, 8. So that's going to be minus 8. And now I'm going to take this value that I found, this critical value, and I'm going to plug it in. Remember, that's how the second derivative test works. I don't draw a number line. I just take the number and plug it in to the second derivative. So a double prime of 50, hmm, well, this is a little weird. I don't have any variables to plug into this a double prime. No variables. That means that a double prime is constant. In other words, no matter what you plug in, you always just get negative 8. So when I plug a double prime of 50, I just get negative 8, because a double prime of anything is negative 8. a double prime is just constantly negative 8. Now, what does my second derivative test say about that? Well, because this is negative, because I plugged in my critical point and got a negative value, that means I have a local maximum at this x equals 50, which is what we were looking for, right? We were looking for a maximum. So that means that the way to maximize the area of my barn, uh, the area of my corral, is to make x be 50. But was that what they were asking, right? Did they just say, what's the value of x that maximizes the area of the crowd? No. Again, if you go back, uh, skip back to the video and look at the question again, the question asked, what are the dimensions of the corral that maximize the area? So the dimensions, well, x is one of the dimensions. 
so x equals 50 feet, and the other dimension I need to know is y. Well, good thing I have a formula for y in terms of x. My formula for y in terms of x was 400 minus 4 times x. I now know that the x that I should use is 50, so I plug that in, and that gives me 200 feet. So those are the dimensions that I need. So it's very important to make sure that you're actually answering the question. Don't just do all the calculus, find your critical value, test it, figure out that it's the max or the min that you want, and then forget to go back and actually give the thing that you were trying to figure out. So here's the general outline. So I've gone through these steps with a couple examples now. So as you work through practice on your own, re again, these are word problems. Every single darn one of them is going to be different. So just practice, practice, practice. Let me know if you have any questions. But um, you know, the more you work through these and follow this outline, you should be in good shape.